that that's the jazz. People mm -hmm. like to hear the jazz. They don't like to hear, well, you mean I'm responsible for the way I live in the world? Yeah, mm -hmm. that's what you're that's the deal. That's what it's all about. discuss cultural and theological issues uh, with various Christians. Today my guest is Dr. Gary DeMar. He is an end times expert, I would say, uh, and we discuss end times, not just when Jesus is coming back and the rapture and this and that, but we get into the Bible, we get into various passages that many people have misinterpreted over the years. Uh, his view is not as popular as it has been in recent years. A very prominent view is premillennialism is kind of what reigns today in most churches and most cultures. He is from a post-millennial uh, perspective, but I hope that you'll watch this video and watch it to its entirety uh, because there's a lot of information there. It's, it's really eye-opening in a lot of ways. So go ahead and watch the whole thing before you form an opinion. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, go ahead and commenting as well. That's helpful. And uh, sharing it, that would really uh, make, make it a world to me. So uh, enjoy the conversation. It's, it's really good. All right. All right. Welcome to Contra Talk. I am Richard Henry, and I have a guest today, Dr. Gary DeMar. He is the president of American Vision. He's been there for over 30 years. He is a father and a grandfather. He's an author, is a speaker. Um, he's got a podcast. He's on YouTube. He's all over the place. He's been teaching and preaching for a long, long time. I would call him an end times expert, and today we're going to talk about uh, mainly end times, uh, the different views, his view of post-millennialism, partial preterist, and uh, what that looks like uh, for the Christian life. So welcome to the show, Gary DeMar. Good to be here. Yeah, thanks for having, thanks, thanks for having me. <laughs> Thank you for coming. <laughs> um, if you wouldn't mind just briefly just discussing your own testimony, uh, coming to faith, and kind of your view of the end times and how that shaped uh, early in your Christian walk. Well, I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I was raised in a Roman Catholic uh, family. My grandparents from Italy, uh, both sets of grandparents, uh, went to Catholic school up through the fifth grade, was an altar boy. So it was, there was never a time where I, 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 I didn't believe in God. Uh, I, I guess the, the moral constraints of the Roman Catholic Church, which in many cases are similar to Protestantism. We said the Apostles' Creed, the Lord's Prayer, the, as a Roman Catholic, it was the uh, Our Father. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, you know, I spent I spent my most of my time in athletics. I uh, was involved in I played football for a little while, and then I, I gravitated to track and field and you excelled did. in the in, in the shot put and uh, was a nationally ranked high school shot putter. I went to college at Western Michigan University on a, a track and field scholarship, and I, I probably. Usually the shot putters are, you know, 6'3", 250, 260 pounds. I was six feet. I weighed 215. Uh, I, I kind of lost my interest because I knew I could only go so far in college. And so I, I kind of drifted through college, got, you know, graduated my senior year in high school. I was in Ann Arbor, Michigan for, for a track meet. I ran into a, a high school friend. Um, and after the meet, we sat down, went to a pub, and he started explaining to me, Late Great Planet Earth. So this was 1973. Okay. So Late Great Planet Earth came out in 1970. Yeah. And it was it was all the rage throughout the 1970s. It probably sold in the neighborhood of 20 some million copies. So wow. You, know, you, you think wow. of that? You think of 20 some million copies. Uh, the Left Behind series, and I think there are probably 12 in the series. Uh, I think they've sold a total of 80 million copies, but there were are 12 of them. So mm -hmm. he had one book that was selling around 20 million copies. Wow! And it was a it was a big big deal because Hal Lindsey had uh, essentially set a timetable. He would say he did, I wasn't he said he wasn't being very specific about it, but he had maintained that Israel becoming a nation again in 1948 was prophetically significant. Uh, it was the it was the budding of the fig tree, and then uh, a generation was forty years. Uh, you add forty to 1948, you get 1988, and so a lot of people were looking at 1988 as kind of the the end point, which would have meant which would have meant that any time between 1981 and 1988, you would uh, you know the rapture could have taken place. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, he was called on this, uh, I think it was late in the, in the 1970s by Ward Gasquay. He said, hey, Hal, what if you're long, wrong about this? And he said, well, there's only one split, one, one split second between being a hero and a bum. And I guess if I'm wrong about this, I'll be a bum. Yeah. He was wrong about this. And nearly everyone else, well, everyone else was wrong about this as well. Chuck Smith said the same types of things. But I have to say that sitting down with my, this, this friend and he was going through late great planet Earth, I really wasn't so fixated on that. I was fixated more on the gospel because my life essentially was going nowhere. Mm -hmm. So in January or February of 1973, I, I became a Christian, but only with the awareness of uh, the late great planet Earth. That was that was it. Um, I went to a, a, a you know, started going to church, uh, but I was I knew not I didn't know anything about anything. I mean, that was uh, I was very, very ignorant in some in some respects. That was a good thing. I didn't have a lot of baggage to unload. Yeah. Uh, so when I, I ended up I ended up going to I ended up going to seminary in 1974. So here I am, an, a brand new, ignorant Christian going to seminary <laughs> a year later. Now, I did do a lot of reading, you know, throughout this this year and talked with friends and so forth. So I went to Reformed Theological Seminary in Jackson, Mississippi, and I, I put the topic of eschatology on the shelf because I as, as I started reading, as I started reading the New Testament, I, I, I didn't see how what I was reading in the New Testament fit with what Hal Lindsey and a lot of these other prophetic speculators were dealing with. OK. And. Providentially, the uh, the librarian uh, had put a, some books of his for sale on a library cart, and I just, I saw this one by Marcellus Kick. Uh, his last name is spelled K I K. Okay. It just said Matthew twenty four, and I bought it. I read it, and it was transformative for me. Uh, essentially, what Kick did is he compared scripture with scripture, went through Matthew twenty four verse by verse, and showed how the how when if you, if you do the comparison shopping way of hermeneutics of comparing scripture with scripture that Jesus was referring not to the end of the world in Matthew 24, but he was referring to the end of the old covenant era and uh, which took place before that particular generation passed away. Okay. And so that for me was transformative. And then I graduated from seminary. I was married, got, graduated from seminary, moved to Atlanta, Georgia, um, taught school for, for a, uh, a few years, and then I started working with American Vision in, in 1981. And the uh, first series I wrote was on, on God and government, how government in, isn't synonymous with politics. But as I went out to teach on this subject, invariably there would be people saying, why are we bothering with all of this? We're living in the last days. Jesus is coming back soon. All the signs are there uh, for us. Uh, to to acknowledge that. And so I had to deal with eschatology in an apologetic way, mm -hmm. showing that what lot, what lots of Christians believe about the end times, the Bible does not teach. Huh. And so that's how I got into the whole eschatology thing. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so that, that leads me then to, um, I guess, what's the difference? Because uh, I, I know a lot of people, so we're originally from California. My wife and I, we moved to Louisville uh, for Southern Seminary. And most people on the West Coast are pre-mill, MacArthur, and, and of course, Chuck Smith being from there and many others. And so I just, you know, obviously, this is this is accurate. This is right. Um, you know, th these are godly men and women. Of course, this makes sense. Go things are going from bad to worse. Of course, the rapture is going to happen. And, you know, no one really talked about a pre trib, mid trib, post trib rapture. It was all kind of, well, the rapture's happening, literal millennium, thousand year reign of Christ. That's why we believe this, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then I went to seminary <clears throat> and I wasn't really familiar with eschatology too much. I actually, my faith was more uh, coming to the Lord was, was beginning, the, the beginning times <laughs> and, and believing materialistic evolution as, as a California right. public school kid and trying to reconcile that with scripture and where to Adam and Eve fit in. That's my own testimony. And so I've focused a lot on the beginning and kind of, you know, for a while was pre-mill. And then I was like, well, maybe I'm pre-mill, uh, but traditional, like the, the non-dispensational. And then I was like, well, maybe I'm a mill. Maybe I'm just pan mill. It'll pan out. <laughs> uh, and, you know, hearing about the other views, 
but realizing, well, you know, there's a replacement theology out there. and You know, the church didn't replace Israel. God still loves Israel. So that was kind of, at least for me, a stumbling block. Um, can you talk about just kind of the difference views? I mean, obviously you can go as deep as you want, but uh, the difference between pre-mill, ah-mill, and post-mill that, that you would say um, is the most accurate? Well, okay. To me, the millennial... I know it's a, I know it's a big question. <laughs> yeah, it is. The, the, the millennial question is... Um, it's not the place to start because a lot of the passages that people use in their uh, building their eschatological system are passages that have nothing to do with the end times. Mm. And I think that's, that is crucial. In fact, I, I, I just wrote an article about uh, creeds, confessions, and eschatology. And if you look at some of the Baptist confessions, uh, and the Westminster, Westminster Confession of Faith, which came out of the 17th, 17th century, and the Baptist Conven uh, Confession of, uh, I think, 1689. Yeah, is that's very, London, yeah. There's very little discussion of eschatology. Hmm. Uh, there's, there's nothing, of, there's very little of the in between of eschatology, and almost, and absolutely nothing about, say, the events of Matthew chapter 24. Uh, the, the you know, little bit about the book of Revelation, but you have to remember a lot of these, I mean, John Calvin didn't even write a commentary on the book of Revelation. So the, the, the confessions aren't that helpful in coming to looking at, at scripture and dealing with these passages, which I believe refer to events surrounding the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. If you don't begin there, if you don't begin with the time indicators of near, shortly, quickly, this generation, uh, the, the Olivet Discourse, a lot of people believe the Olivet Discourse, uh, wars and rumors of wars and famines and earthquakes and gospel being preached in the whole world and all that. They say, oh, this, this, th that hasn't happened yet. Sun, moon and stars going dark and falling and all that. That hasn't happened yet. But yet, according to what Jesus said in Matthew 24, 34, and this is what Kick's book did. Kick's book said, Every time this generation is used in the Gospels, especially in Matthew's Gospel, it always refers to the generation to whom Jesus is speaking. Yeah. So if he said in, in Matthew 24, 34, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place, that means everything before verse 34 had to have taken place before that generation passed away. Now, a lot of people say, well, that's just impossible. Are you saying that the, the Gospel had, in fact, been preached to the whole world before that generation passed away? And I said, look, do you believe the Bible or not? Do you believe what Jesus <laughs> had to say or not? I mean, that's yeah. really the question. If what, so people will go and say, well, what Jesus really meant is this race will not pass away until all these things take place. Mm. And they'll say that refers to the Jewish race. Well, that makes no sense because everything's supposed to be about the Jews. And if you take that position, what you get is uh, the Jewish race will not pass away until all these things take place, which the logic of that tells you that when all these things take place, the Jewish race passes away. Yeah, so that, so the <laughs> and they don't want that. Yeah, the logic is wrong on that. And yeah. also, the, the word that's used is wrong. There is a very, very specific Greek word for race, and it's genos, and there's a very, very specific Greek word for generation, and that's genia. You look at Matthew 1.17, you'll see how genia is used, and it cannot ever mean race. And the other argument is say, well, it says when... Uh, the generation that sees these signs will not pass away until all these things take place. Well, there's a problem there. Look what you have to do. You have to get rid of the word this. Then you have to add the words uh, that sees these signs. So you have to take away a word and add words in order to get it to mean what you want it to mean. Uh, and, and yet verse 33, Jesus is very specific about they are the ones, they're the generation that's going to see those signs. And the other one is they'll say, well, it's this kind of generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Hmm. And you'd say, again, you've had a, you added a word here. Uh, and uh, so anyway, and, and then you're, you're stuck with the near demonstrative this, this generation. And put yourself in the position of that audience. And Jesus is speaking to that audience, and it uses the second person plural, uh, you, know, you. You will be hearing of wars and rivers of wars when you see the abomination of desolation. Uh, they will persecute you. Uh, it's very specific. If Jesus had a future generation in mind, he would have said they, yeah. and he would have said that generation. But so that's the key passage. 
And once you deal with you know, Matthew 24 and Mark 13 and Luke 21, it changes your whole dynamic about how you're viewing the last days because Jesus is not describing there what it's going to be like at the end, you know, the, the near end of the world when Jesus is going to return. It's dealing with events leading up to and including the destruction of Jerusalem because the, the topic of the, of, of the Olivet Discourse is the disciples came up to Jesus and said, hey, when is this temple going to be destroyed that you just said earlier their house was going to be left to them desolate? And Jesus said, look, not one stone here will be left upon another. It will all be torn down. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what took place. The temple was destroyed. Not one stone was left upon another before that generation passed away. So that's where you have to start. You have to start with passages that deal specifically with the timing of certain prophetic events. And then only then can you deal with the millennial question, the pre-mill, the post-mill, the all-mill, the dispensational pre-mill, and, and so forth. Yeah. Yeah, it seems like, a, I mean, at least in my, so we've been a part of a handful of churches that have been saved for about, what, 12 years now, something like that. So going to church as a kid, but not really, and, you know, kind of just not really knowing what anything meant other than just kind of basic American Christianity, whatever that is. Um, but having, having just kind of a one-sided discussion or a one-sided opinion and saying, well, and kind of jumping to the future and looking and saying, well, this is happening. And, and you know, for lack of a better word, it seems like a lot of times even godly pastors that we've had and others and just even authors, um, they seem to look at the, the, the newspaper <laughs> more yeah. than they're looking at the Bible. And, you know, we don't do that with, we don't say, well, you know, science has clearly said this, therefore, I guess we need to reinterpret Genesis. Now, some people do that, and I would completely disagree with them. Um, but, you know, something along those lines are, well, you can't really make fish and bread from nothing. So, you know, and we know the liberals and the moderates or whatever they want to call themselves have tried that for the last century or so, uh, maybe more. But it's funny that you have the most you know, very staunch, very conservative, you know, the earth is recent, the cosmos is recent, you know, Jesus is the way, the truth, the life, substitution only in him. He is all this stuff, you know, they would line up, line up, line up. And then you think, but why are you all of a sudden adding and changing? Like you just said, they're adding these words and changing this thing because they're seemingly taking a presupposition of, well, if things are going from bad to worse, there's wars and rumors of wars, obviously, Look around, you know, look at the newspaper. Well, look at Israel. Look at this. Look at this. Um, and anyway, it's it's, yeah, it's here's, here's the thing. Confusing. <laughs> if you look at every generation. I mean, uh, Oswald J. Smith wrote a book in 1926 and it talked about the Antichrist. Mm. Now, um, people get people get the Antichrist doctrine wrong so often. It's 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 it's, it's sad. Uh, but Oswald J. Smith said that Mussolini was the Antichrist. Well, that didn't work out well because right. Mussolini was eventually, you know, assassinated, and that was that was the end of that. Yeah. And 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 Smith actually, when he went out to speak, he he kind of repented of that of that view, obviously. And I've heard that he actually said, "Look, if you've got copies of my book." Please bring them in, and I'll I'll I'll, I'll buy them back for you. Mm -hmm. I mean, Hal Lindsey has never done that um, with late great planet Earth, but so every every generation every generation believed it was the generation based upon that view of eschatology, on that view of Matthew chapter twenty four. Every generation, Hitler was right. the Antichrist. Uh, you go back to French Revolution. You got the, the Russian Revolution. Uh, even the, the Civil War, every time there was a war, there was some sort of thing going on politically, you will find the same Bible verses being used to try to prove that it was the last days and Jesus was coming back soon. We published a book a number of years ago called The Day and the Hour, and Frank Gummerlock went through the whole history of all the different Antichrist uh, candidates, the Gog and Magog candidates, uh, it, it just... It's, it's amazing how often this takes place, but we're so provincial in our thinking that we think that only our time is important. Only the things that are going on today are significant. Yeah. And there, there is a name for this. Um, it's called newspaper exegesis. Mm 
You read the newspaper, you look out there, and you see what takes place, and you say, oh, this is all fitting. Wars and rumors of wars. I mean, come on. There were wars and rumors of wars in the first century. Earthquakes in various places. They'll say, oh, there's going to be, there are more earthquakes today than there ever been. No, there aren't. We have measuring devices that measure them more, uh, more accurately. And the thing of it is, Jesus did, didn't say there'd be more earthquakes. He says there would just be earth, great earthquakes in various places. Yeah. And sure enough, there was an earthquake at the time of the cross. There was an earthquake that released Peter from pr prison. If you look, study the period between AD 30 and AD 70, earthquakes all, all over the place. Um, the, the Pompeii, I mean, a, vol a volcanic eruption is, in fact, a, 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 an earthquake. It's, a, it's, a, it's the same principles involved. Mm -hmm. Famines, famines in various places. If you look at Acts chapter, I think it's Acts chapter 11, it says, there was a prophecy about there was going to be a famine all over the Roman Empire, and this was this prophecy was given during the reign of Claudius. The gospel being preached in the whole world. People say you're not telling me that the gospel had been in fact preached in the whole world by AD 70. And I said again, who are you going to believe? You're going to believe what the Bible says, or you're going to believe your conception of what you think the Bible says? Mm -hmm. I said you you cannot prove to me that the gospel had been been preached throughout the whole world before that generation passed away. And I said, if I, if I can show you from the Bible, because that's the only way you, you should believe, if I show you from the Bible that that's true, will you believe me? And they said, yeah, but I know you can't do that. So I take them through Matthew 24, 14. The Greek word that's used there isn't cosmos, it's oikumene. It's mm -hmm. the same Greek word that's used for the famine, in Acts chapter 11, and it's the same Greek word that's used in Luke 2, 1 about the extent of the tax that the Romans um, were, were going to put on the people uh, and during the reign of, um, let's see, who, well, how's, how's that go? Uh, I think it, it's Acts chapter 2, 1, that there was a, a, a tax levied over the whole world. Well, the Greek word is oikumene. It was just the, the, the Roman Empire. And so, but if you read if you read through the New Testament, the Apostle Paul says that the gospel had been preached to every creature under heaven, every creature under heaven. Uh, first, uh, let's see, Colossians one twenty six, Colossians one three, Romans one eight. In fact, if you go to uh, the sixteenth chapter of Romans, Paul said that the gospel had been preached to all the nations. Mm -hmm. the Bible the Bible says says that this was the this was the case. Because the text says in Matthew 24, 14, that the gospel goes out as a witness, as a witness. That's different from the Great Commission, which is in the, which is in the end of Matthew's gospel. But there were earthquakes, there were famines, false, false prophets. Of 1 John chapter 4, verse 1 talks about there were false prophets in the world. Uh, stars, uh, there's a very famous uh, uh, per person, well, I'll tell you who it is, Kirk Cameron. Kirk Cameron listen to a video series that I did on this. He went through point by point, and he says, there's no way Gary DeMar can, can prove to me that the sun, moon, and stars language that you find in Matthew chapter 24 refers to events about AD 70. Well, after he watched it, and after I gave him the scriptural analysis of all that, he had to agree. That language is used throughout the Old Testament to describe the destruction on nations. Mm -hmm. All you have to do is go to Isaiah chapter 13. In fact, Jesus alludes to that in his in, in Matthew chapter 24. This deconstruction, decreation language is used throughout the Old Testament to describe the end of nations, the judgment on nations. So you've got to deal with all of that first before you can deal with the with the millennial question. And so now we get to Revelation chapter 20, where everyone builds their millennial view on Revelation chapter 20. It's the only time, well, it's not the only time thousand is used, but it's the only time where it says that uh, uh, Jesus will reign for a thousand years. H here's the problem. Revelation 20 does not describe a millennium. It describes a thousand years, which is said to be a millennium only because that's, that's the, 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 I think it's the, uh, yeah, the Latin, Latin word for thousand. Mm -hmm. but it doesn't describe a millennium at all. <clears throat> It doesn't give the idea there's going to be peace on the earth. It doesn't say that Jesus is going to reign on, uh, on the throne in Jerusalem. Uh, it doesn't say that the temple is going to be rebuilt. There are going to be animal sacrifices again. It doesn't say any of those things. 
It does not, Revelation 20 does not describe a golden age. Mm. And yet that's the passage that all the millennial positions use to try to prove their, their, their millennial view. Uh, so you've got to go elsewhere to deal with the future. What happens? Uh, what should we think about? What, what has God promised us about the future regarding the nations and the gospel going into all the world? Um, th that's how you develop a, that's how you de develop a, a, a proper millennial perspective. I don't really care for that term because it takes you back to Revelation 20. Yeah. So th th these are things that, that Christians just need to you know, grab a hold of. And that's why I wrote Last Day's Madness and Wars and Rumors of Wars to deal with these 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 things in terms of uh, what the Bible, but a lot of the passages that Christians go to to prove that we're living in the last days. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, uh, all right. So then what would you say? Um, so again, there, the, in the package of, you know, pre-mill that most people believe, most non-believers believe it, I've heard you say, and many others, um, everybody has an eschatology, right? And most of it's right. pessimistic. Most of it's, it's uh, things are going from bad to worse. I mean, clearly, just look around. I mean, obviously, children, they're disobeying their parents. There's this, there's that. There's all sorts of, look at the LGBT stuff. Look at all the just abortion, yeah, all listen, this stuff. If someone should think about that a second, as if this is new stuff, uh, all you have to do is read Romans chapter 1 about homosexuality. I have to read first first Corinthians chapter 6 about homosexuality. I have to read is first Timothy chapter one on homosexuality. Yeah. I mean, the Roman Empire, the Greek Empire before that was rampant with homosexuality. What made the difference is, is that Christian Christians took their worldview into the broader culture and changed the laws. It didn't mean that, that homosexuality was going to end. It only meant that homosexuality would go underground again, like most sins because yeah. of the, the culture and, and so forth today because Christians have not been involved in the culture, have not been involved in the legal aspects of things, have, have uh, you know, we've turned our children over to the state to be, you know, for them to be, to be educated. And we wonder why we're in the mess we're in today. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, you see what, what the homosexuals are, are, are claiming. There was something put out by the San Francisco gay chorus. Oh. Where the homosexuals were just very, we're going to, we're coming after your, your children. Yeah. And, I, I just that. did a podcast on this about things I've, 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 I've seen and had on my computer for quite some time. They have always had an agenda in order to radicalize your children. And this is why I think we're seeing young people just, you know, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm one of 72 you know, different, different genders. And you've got, you know, and everybody's, everybody's has given into this. Christians, dom denominations have given into this. Yeah. It's not because we're living in the last days. It's because we're not following Jesus's command to go into all the world and make, make disciples of all the nations, teaching them whatsoever I've commanded you. There are lots of Christians out there who don't even believe we should be, you know, applying God's law to the broader culture. Yeah. So uh, th th this is this is where we are. And to, then all of a sudden you start throwing in this idea. Ah, we're living in the last days. Why are we even bothering with this? Uh, because Jesus is coming soon. I just, some guy on Facebook, you know, he's just all excited. He said, you know, Jesus is coming soon. All the, all the events, are, everything's in place for it all. No, that's just not the case because people generation after generation believe the same way, using the same Bible verses. And as a result of that, Christians have laid back, not gotten involved because, well, we shouldn't be polishing brass on a sinking ship. Why rearrange, you know, the deck chairs on the Titanic? It's all mm -hmm. going to come down. I've been hearing this for 20, 30, 40 years. Yeah. Now, don't you think that has an impact on, on the Christian community if, if, if that's what they believe? Yeah. Yeah, I remember even in 2008, right around coming to faith for me and, you know, Obama and the excitement and, oh, he's this and great and he's going to bring unity. And of course, we, <laughs> we know all better that that didn't happen. But I remember there was a lot of people that, uh, well, Obama's the Antichrist, obviously. He, I mean, just look at how he acts. Look at this. Look at the promises. Look at all these things. And it was almost like, you know, you're waiting in 2008 in the fall there, whenever oh, November it was like, all right, you know, is the rapture going to happen right before? Is it going to be like an inauguration day? And here we are, you know, and and we've had now had two guys since. And it's just kind of like, 
Yeah. Uh, and, and of course, being a very new, new believer, knowing a little bit about it, but really understanding the gospel for the first time and being, you know, mildly scared, mildly like, is this really what this means? And and can we really know? And it, I mean, there's been bad stuff all along. I mean, yeah. there've been wars. Have, what about, what, a, what, about library, what about all these people? I have a library full of those types of books. Yeah. That sell now for 10 cents. I remember when we went, we went into Iraq. And mm. that was that was supposed to be the revival of, of, of Babylon. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and then there was um, John Walvert's book, which I think came out in 1976 during the o during the oil crisis. You probably I don't know how old you are, but uh, it was before my time. I don't remember people talking yeah, about the it. Oil though, you had to, you had to get in line and if your license plate began with an odd number of whatever it was, you had Mondays and the other Monday, Wednesday and Friday and the other ones are Tuesday, Thursday and Saturday. A lot of people don't remember all that. And John Walvoord wrote a book, Armageddon Oil and the Middle East Crisis. This was in 1976. And every, it seems like every time there was something new, he came out with a revised version of the book in order to make it fit what was happening in the world. And these, like I said, I've got a library full of this stuff. And unfortunately, a lot of Christians out there, they hear, hear some, some popular minister. Well, he certainly can't be lying to me. I don't think they're, that they're consciously lying. I just don't think they know what they're talking about. Yeah. Uh, and if, if, again, I've been dealing with this for a long time. I've had debates on this from one end of the, you know, one end of the country to the other end of the country. And it's this, it's this, they use the same arguments, uh, and they're they're you know just plain poor arguments. Uh, I, I get I get messages in my email about you know learning the you know how the Book of Revelation is. They've never written a commentary on other, any other book of the Bible, but they're going to write they're going to do something on the Book of Revelation, which they claim is they're going to give you a literal interpretation of the book of Revelation. I don't know anyone. I don't know anyone who, who, who looks at the book of Revelation and says, we take it word for word literal. Now, if it says there's a giant woman out in space uh, who's big enough you know, to stand on the moon and uh, fireproof enough to be clothed with the sun and, and have a head big enough so she can have 12 t stars around her head. And if anybody really believes that that there's really that's out there. We we know they don't interpret the book of Revelation like like that. They're dragons with heads and so forth. This is it's a book of symbols. Yeah. And if you look at the very first verse in the book uh, in the book of Revelation, it says that these things are about, about to happen soon. Verse three, the time is near. Twenty two ten says the time is near. Uh, and, and so. 2,000 years pass, and people say, oh, but a 1,000 years with the Lord is one day, and one day is a 1,000 years. So you completely overrule every single time indicator in the Bible by going to 2 Peter 3.8. Uh, and I, again, you can go to AmericanVision.org. I wrote an article, a series of articles about that. Mm -hmm. This is what you have to do in order to get your position to say what you need it to, need to, it to say. And by doing that, you you uh, immobilize Christians because they're always living on the precipice of some, you know, soon eschatological event that's going to rescue them from the mess that we're in today. Yeah. Yeah. Can you. Uh, so I want to do two things. Can you flesh out what it means to be because I, I heard this a lot, you know, and especially your first exposure to something. It's like, well, I'm going to believe that um, being literal, number one, and then number two, the implications what it means to be literal when someone says, well, I just say, I don't know about you post mill guys or ah mill guys. You know, a lot of the liberals were ah mill back in the day. I just take the Bible literally, as you said. Can you flesh that out a little bit more? Isn't there like a Latin phrase or a Latin word that it's taken from and what it well, actually means? Literal means to take it according to the literature. Okay. And that's the way we do with everything. We do everything according to the literature. You can tell, you know, sarcasm, you know, some comedian gets up there and says something sarcastically. Uh, we got the metaphors and similes. They're all different types of figures of speech. Uh, and uh, I'll give you a good example. Here's here's what you can do. You, you, you go to Psalm 18. Let me pull this up here real fast. Psalm 18 is, is, is a very good example of how you can understand how the symbolic language is used. I'm doing this 
a little light here. Here's how Psalm 18 begins, all right? For the choir director, a Psalm of David, the servant of the Lord, who spoke to the Lord, the words of this song, now listen to this, in the day that the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. All right, so that's what this Psalm is all about. Let's see, so um, verse seven. Then the earth shook and quaked, and the foundations of the mountains were trembling and were shaken because he was angry. Smoke went up out of his nostrils, and fire from his mouth devoured coals were kindled by it. He, he bowed the heavens also and came down with thick darkness under his feet. And he rode upon a cherub and flew, and he sped through the wing, uh, upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness his hiding place, the canopy around about him, darkness of waters, thick clouds of the skies. And it goes on and on and on. But wait a minute. That never happened. If you go back and look at all of the battles that, that David had with Saul, none of these things are mentioned in there. Hmm. The literature is different. One is a historical narrative, and the other one is a symbolic representation of that uh, historical era. And if you look at the, the book of Revelation, it says this is a, a, a um, it, it's of, of signs. It's, it's the symbolic nature of something that's going to take place. Uh, the first of the first three chapters are dealing mostly with the history. You got you talk about seven churches, what was taking place in those seven churches, and there's still there's a lot of um, uh, there's a little I hate to use the word license, but there's a lot of literary license in what what you read there. Yeah, in, in the number of times that Jesus says he's going to come to that church, is he going to come physically to that church? Is is, is that the second coming? <clears throat> no. It's a judgment coming. It's a coming in judgment against that church. And yeah. oftentimes when you read about Jesus' coming, it isn't necessarily the second coming. It's a coming in judgment. So literal, you have to pay attention, cl pay close attention to the type of literature that it is. And sometimes there are things that are, that they're mixed. If you look at Matthew chapter 24, most of it is very, very literal. There were real wars and rumors of wars. There were real false Christs. There were real famines. There were real earthquakes. There was the real gospel that went into the, the real oikumene, the real world. Uh, there was a real abomination of, of desolation. There's some hyperbole in there. But yet when Jesus starts quoting from the Old Testament about sun, moon, and stars language, you've got to take that and say, okay, Jesus is, is referencing the Old Testament. You've got to go back to the Old Testament and see how it was used there. That's what you have to do to, to, to try and interpret, interpret Scripture. Even the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. Jesus is quoting from Daniel chapter 7. And if you go back to Daniel chapter 7, verse 13, the Son of Man is coming up to the Ancient of Days. He's not hmm. coming down to earth. He's going up. Hmm. And, what is, and what is the sign of the Son of Man in heaven? The sign is, is that the Son of Man is in heaven. That's the sign. It's the sign of the ascension of Christ sitting at, at, at the Father's right hand. That's the sign of the Son of Man. And that is the thing that upset the, the Jewish establishment more than anything else. Because if you go to Matthew chapter 26, you'll begin to see that Jesus quotes that, and he's accused of blasphemy right there. Right. Caiaphas saw it as blasphemy because Jesus was saying that he, in fact, it says here, from now on you, Caiaphas, will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven hmm. with power and great glory. And not only Caiaphas, but those in his audience as well. It was this, this is missed by so many Christians because they're so focused on this idea that all these passages refer to some distant end time view. And nobody in Jesus' day in Matthew chapter 24 would have would have thought when they heard the word when you will you will be you will see uh, here you will hear a, a wars and rumors of wars or you will see the abomination of je desolation or when you see Jerusalem surrounded surrounded by armies in Luke in Luke chapter twenty one none of them thought none of them thought of some oh it's not really talking about us yeah and, and this is important because when you get to Second Peter chapter three Peter starts starts Second uh, Peter three describing the scoffers. 
The scoffers, who were the scoffers? The scoffers were those people who said Jesus predicted he was going to come before that generation passed away, and we're still here. In fact, the temple is more glorious than it ever was. Hmm. A few years later, the temple was destroyed. They were the scoffers. Yeah. People today who are questioning how people interpret Bible prophecy aren't the ones scoffing. The scoffers were those who did not believe what Jesus had to say about his own prediction that he would come in against Jerusalem in, in, in terms of judgment. Yeah, that's interesting, too, because, I mean, it, it really, once you kind of re not reinterpret, but once you kind of stand at a different angle and say, oh, I see he's saying you, he's talking to his audience, he's talking to these people here uh, uh or even in second peter there he's talking about when you and the scoffers will say in the last days so right. on and so forth and we all think you know me included like well as in the days of noah so shall the coming of son of man be and therefore wow you know, it's wicked and obviously the days of noah were wicked and the judgment came and flood and so on but it's judgment and uh yeah one is one of one what, what judgment one <laughs> Exactly. And people say, oh, that's the rapture. Well, it's, it's not the rapture. It's literally, that's, if you're talking about literalism, that's exactly literally what happened. Mm -hmm. when the Romans came, they killed Josephus, the Roman historian at that time said, you know, more than a, a million Jews were killed because they did not flee the city. They did not heed Jesus's warning. And others were taken. Mm -hmm. They were taken as slaves uh, throughout, the, throughout the Roman Empire, some as, as many as, as, as 50,000. And the thing about the days of Noah, they will be um, uh, marrying and giving in marriage, and people will say, "Oh, that's you know that's sinful behavior." No, that's not what's being described there. What's being described there is things were going on as normal as, mm -hmm. as people were marrying, they were building homes, they were doing things normally, and it was the same thing in in Noah's day. Things were normal. There was no indication that there was going to be a flood. And the same in Jesus' day, there was no outward manifestation that the, the, the Romans were going to come in and dis destroy the city. Things were just going on as usual. And then as you got closer to the A.D. 70, there was a rebellion that took place, and the Jews decided this, this was their, their opportunity to try to go up against Rome, and they got slaughtered, something Jesus had predicted. But in that prediction, Jesus had warned them. Mm-hmm. We, you know, flee. In fact, to, to, to show you that this is not a worldwide end of the world scenario, in order to in order to escape what Jesus had predicted, all you had to do is on foot get out of Jerusalem and go to the mountains. That's all you had to do. And if and, and if you look at that, it says those who are on the rooftop, rooftop. What do you mean rooftop? What does that mean? I, I sit on my rooftop all the time. What do you yeah, say? Yeah, who sits on the <laughs> rooftop? Well, well the yeah. people in Israel did because their roofs were flat. And there's a, you know, the story in there. Remember, the people were surrounded a house, and Jesus was healing people, and yeah, they took the men up on the roof and removed some part of the roof and lowered him in. Uh, your cloak, you know, you know, if you have to leave your cloak behind, who cares about a cloak? Well, in those days, a cloak was extremely important, and Sabbath was was operating. Pray mm -hmm. that it doesn't happen on the Sabbath. Well, we just don't do that. We, this isn't. We don't follow Sabbath legislation. So, mm -hmm. according to their view, we've got to go all the way back to Israel and Jerusalem in order for this to take place. No, it was a local judgment that took place before that generation passed away. And I know people say, oh, "I just never heard this before." Mm -hmm. I'm not giving. I'm not saying anything that hasn't been written about. For, for literally for centuries. Yeah. This is not an uncommon view, an uncommon interpretation of the Olivet Discourse. What is new is this idea that prior to a seven year period, the, the church is gonna be taken off the earth in something called a rapture. There isn't a single verse in the New Testament that says anything about the church being taken off the earth before, during, or after a seven year period, nothing. Mm -hmm. Not nowhere do you find this, and yet it is the centerpiece of so much modern day eschatological thinking. Wow, yeah, so there is a lot of piecemealing going on. What are some of the verses? I mean, you mentioned Matthew 24, Daniel 7. What are some verses that people watching this and just in general could go and look at and say, Okay, well, my pastor or this guy or growing up or whatever happening, I read this this way. 
what are some other passages besides Matthew 24 and Daniel 7 that people look at and either should examine again and say, well, what if it actually is prior to AD 70? What if this is talking about destruction or what if this is talking about just Jerusalem being leveled or something along those lines instead of a, a, a pre-mill futurist point of view? What are some of the passages well, that I, people can look at? Yeah, one of the first things you need to do is that, you know define Antichrist. I mean, everybody talks about the Antichrist. <laughs> I always ask people, give me a biblical definition of antichrist. Mm -hmm. said, somebody who opposes Christ. I, well, okay, yeah, but give me a biblical definition of antichrist. A biblical definition of antichrist is somebody who denies that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. Yeah. Second, uh, yeah, Second John verse seven. That's a biblical definition of antichrist. How many antichrists are there? Oh, there's more than one. Yes, John says there are many antichrists. When were the antichrists? First John chapter two, verse 18 says the Antichrists were already in the world. There are a bunch of them. Who were the Antichrists? Well, you know the definition, those who deny that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, most likely the Antichrist were Jews who opposed Jesus Christ in the gospel, just like they did in the gospels. And this is why John in, in the book of Revelation talks about the synagogue of Satan. These were unbelieving Jews. Many of them had actually been in the church, been in the congregation, and then ended up leaving, opposing the things of Christ. Uh, so this is the kind of the apostasy that we, we, we read about. Mm -hmm. So if you don't understand the definition of antichrist, any bad guy in the world, it fits the made up definition. Stick to the definition, you won't be led astray. And what's funny is there isn't, the word antichrist doesn't appear in the book of Revelation. You would think that that's that would you know, kind of tip you off that it's not dealing with the Antichrist it does talk about beasts, but the idea of beasts are political figures. Romans, I mean, Revelation chapter 13, there's a sea beast and there's a land beast of sea beast was probably first century Rome and the land beast was, was, was Israel. Um, the other one is second uh, Thessalonians chapter two, the man of lawlessness. Mm -hmm. uh, you read about the man of lawlessness who takes his seat in the temple well, the temple was still standing in John's in John's day and in, in Paul's day. And Paul, but look what Paul says. You know what restrains him now, which means the man of lawlessness must have been alive in Paul's day because the temple was still standing and he was being restrained at that particular period of time. And the other thing is here that Paul says, look, don't don't be don't be upset if you you get a letter or some sort of communication from me that the day of the Lord had already come. You think, well, wait a minute. If this is about the rapture of the second coming, how would Paul have sent them a letter that had already come? It, it's, it just doesn't make any sense. And I, I deal with this in a great detail in my book, Last Day's Madness. I deal mm -hmm. with Second Thessalonians uh, 2. I deal with the Antichrist. Uh, I, you know, deal with the number 666, all these passages that people pull together to try to es establish a prophetic theme uh, based upon, as you said, you know, a piecemeal, piecemeal approach. And B.B. Warfield had said that that's how the definition of modern day definition of Antichrist is. It's a piecemeal <laughs> approach. Take a little from here, take a little bit from there, take a little bit from here, and you put together and you create kind of a an antichrist monster, just like the Frankenstein monster was 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 created. Yeah, by little bits and pieces of things. But you have to understand and interpret all these passages within their immediate context. Pay attention to the audience and pay attention to the time indicators. First, John chapter two verse eighteen tells you there are many antichrists, and it tells you that those antichrists were indicative of that something was on the near horizon. Uh, prophetic uh, horizon dealing with, I believe, the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. Yeah. Okay. No, that's good. Um, so then, so most people, at least I, from my understanding, would say, um, you know, the Gospels were written and then in Galatians was probably one of the first books and probably James and Revelation was written way later, probably like 90, 95 AD when John was a really old man. But if he's talking a lot about the destruction of the temple and destruction of Jerusalem in general, that was 20, 25 years before, but he's saying measure the temple, but 
Well, this has to be a third temple then because the temple's already gone at this point. So are you saying then that you believe that that uh, the revelation was written earlier than, than, than the destruction of the temple? Yeah, because you read, first of all, the New Testament doesn't say anything about a rebuilt temple. And even people who claim that there's going to be a rebuilt temple admit the New Testament doesn't say anything about a rebuilt temple. Mm-hmm. So oh, what am I supposed to do at this point? The burden of proof is not on me to prove that there isn't going to be a rebuilt temple. The burden of proof is on those who claim there is going to be a rebuilt temple who admit that the New Testament doesn't say anything about a rebuilt temple who <laughs> continue to claim there's going to be a rebuilt temple. Yeah. So if you read the book of Revelation, the very first verse tells us these things are about to take place. Verse 3, the time is near. Uh, John describes himself as a fellow participant in the tribulation. So this tribulation period was, in fact, going on in, when, when John was, was, was you know, on, on the island of Patmos. And we don't know why he was on the island of Patmos. Mm-hmm. It doesn't say that he was that uh, Nero had put it, sent him there and all that. All we know is he was on the Isle of Patmos. He may have been ministering there. God may have sent, you know, sent him there to write the revelation. We don't, we don't know. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, we know that these things were a, 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 about to take place. In fact, if you go to look at, um, let's see, Revelation chapter 3, verse 10. This is a passage that a lot of people, again, they, they just don't get right. It says, because you have, this is to the church at Philadelphia. Now, these were real, these were seven churches, seven Mm -hmm. real churches. Because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I also will keep you from the hour of testing, that hour which is about to come upon the whole oikumene, not the whole cosmos, Mm. to test those who dwell, who, who dwell upon the earth or the land. So this was something that was about to take place. Most translations don't get that. They, they, they translate mellow as like it's just going to take place. But the Greek word here that's used is oikumene. And I wrote a book called The Rapture and the Fig Tree Generation where I deal with all of that. Mm-hmm. So, and then you find that in, uh, in the book of Revelation, the temple is still standing. In Revelation chapter 11, the temple is still standing. John is told to measure the temple. And there are still worshipers in the temple. And there's Mm. the outer court of the Gentiles. Mm. So that's part of the dating aspect of this. The the time text and the the, the temple is still standing. Um, One one of the uh, one of the kings, he he was, you know, is now, it says, is now, which Mm -hmm. was alive then in John's day. Many people believe that was was Nero, Uh, the six hundred and sixty six. If, if put into uh, Hebrew Hebrew letters, because you have to remember Hebrew letters in Hebrew were also, um, uh, yeah, the, the numbers were actually letters. Okay. The first three, first letter, first nine letters of the Hebrew alphabet would take you one through nine, and it would take you all the way through. So you could count, you could make do, you could do numbers in terms of of of, of Hebrew letters. And so if you put if you, you put the 666 in Hebrew letters, you get you get Neron Kaiser, Nero Kaiser. Mm. Um, if, if in fact there's some manuscripts that have 616 instead of 666, and I, I won't go through the complications of all this, but both of them fit the Nero context. Huh. The, best, the best book on this is uh, by Ken Gentry called Before Jerusalem Fell, which he goes through the detail of showing that the book of Revelation was written before the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. Okay. Wow. Yeah. I just listened to something maybe a week or so ago. Uh, I, I hadn't heard of him. Um, what are some people, so you obviously you're, you're, I would say an expert on this. I mean, you're definitely well, well versed. I don't, uh, I, I don't say, I don't tell people I'm an expert on this. I generally say I usually know more than most people know. <laughs> uh, and, well, that's fair. So that's, you know, I, I don't, I'm a I'm a look simple guy that if you just if you just stick with the scriptures, you know, comparing scripture with scripture, you can do this on your own. You'll notice I haven't quoted any secondary source yeah. for my position. It's just simply comparing scripture with scripture. Uh, no, that's good. You, we should we should be Bereans. We search the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. That's good. And if the apostle Paul 
if they could do that to the Apostle Paul, when Paul came into the church of Berea after being thrown out by the, you know, the, the Thessalonian Jews, if you read, if you read that in Acts chapter, uh, Acts chapter uh, you know, 17, and compare that with 1 Thessalonians 1 and 1 Thessalonians, uh, yeah, and yeah, 1 Thessalonians 1 and uh, 2 Thessalonians 1, you will see what was taking place in, in Thessalonica. So Paul goes to Berea, and the Bereans didn't say, "Oh, this is the Apostle Paul. We're going to listen to everything he say says, and we're not we're not going to think a thing about it." No, they searched. The, they were more noble minded than those in Thessalonica because they searched the Scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Yeah, I put my work on the line. Search what I have to say. Compare Scripture with Scripture. Uh, now, not everybody is going to go along with what I have to say because they'll go read someone else. And they'll say, well, this guy says that, and I don't know who you are, and, you know, so forth. Oh, okay, fine. Uh, but you are bound to follow what Scripture has to say. You are not bound to follow what I say or what any other prophecy writer or any other so-called expert writes uh, says it as, as well. That's good. Um, who are some others, both present and past, um, you mentioned B.B. Warfield, Ken Gentry. Who are some other uh, theologians, pastors, authors, uh, that have this post-mill partial preterist view? Because uh, I think most people think, well, John MacArthur, right? he's pre-mill, and this guy and that guy, and all these you know, popular pastors and preachers. This has clearly been the case for centuries and centuries, and all the other views, they're just not taking the Bible seriously, or they, they misinterpret the scripture or whatever. Who are some others who have this uh, same view that you're saying? Well, uh, you have to keep in mind that w we have... We have defined these millennial positions very in very particular ways: pre-mill, post-mill, all-mill, dispensational. Mm -hmm. Those those phrases don't exist very much in history at all. They're they're recent designations for for systems. So what you have to do is you got to you have to you know like uh, C. H. Spurgeon sounds like a post-millennialist. Mm -hmm. He might have been you know pre-millennial. Um, you. Find someone like John Lightfoot, who was a participant at the Westminster, uh, the development of the Westminster Confession of Faith in, in, in the 17th century. He was a preterist. He believed like Matthew 24 was fulfilled already. Um, so it, it's, it's difficult to position people in terms of their millennial position because they would have defined it different from the way we, we do. The Puritans, for example, were were mostly post millennial. Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't believe that the church was going to be raptured before, during, or after a seven year period. Uh, they many of them believed, like the reformers before them, that the Roman Catholic Church, the papacy, was you know the antichrist. But they were very optimistic. I mean, if you go and you read the early writings of the founders who came over here, you know that the uh, you know coming to the to what would become the United States was just a a stepping stone for the advancement of the gospel in the world. Mm. And they, they believed um, they believed that the gospel would in fact ha have success throughout the world, which is essentially what a post-millennial view is. And so if you got a book by uh, Ian Murray called The Puritan Hope, it's very post-millennial. Uh, there's another one by a fellow named De Young uh, called As the Waters Cover the Sea, which goes through all the writings of these, these men over the years that show their their post millennial view, but you won't you won't see these guys saying, "Hey, I'm post millennial, and here's why." What you will find is taking for certain scripture passages and applying them to the world in which they live, which we would interpret today interpret today as a post millennial view. Gotcha. Okay. So, so then, David Chilton, David Chilton, Paradise Restored, uh, Days of Vengeance are two very good books on post millennialism. Okay. Um, uh, Lorraine Bettner, uh, his book on, on post-millennialism, on the millennium, is, is, is very good as well. I mentioned Spurgeon has a lot of post-millennial you know, stuff in it. Mm -hmm. on, preter on preterism, on like Matthew 24, what I, I believe, you know, Thomas Scott, um, uh, uh, Clark, uh, John Lightfoot, you know, so many of them held this same position. I, I, like I say, my book's Last Day's Madness, Wars and Rumors of Wars. Um, and uh, the, the uh, deal deal with all of this the historical stuff as well as the biblical material. Okay, that's good. Um, I guess 
maybe to wrap up here, what is, I mean, this has been amazing. I really appreciate this. Uh, and just kind of fleshing out. I mean, it's a, obviously a very large topic, but what are the, the, obviously we kind of went some with, with some of the background and look at that, the theology, a lot of times people kind of get, well, yeah, I will just all, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. How, how does this really affect my life? I mean, what's the big deal? Jesus is coming back. I mean, if there's a rapture, if there isn't, if there's an antichrist, if there isn't, I mean, you know, lay out for, for someone who's still on the fence and says, that sounds great, Dr. Tomorrow. That sounds really great. Uh, but I've got kids to raise and I've got a business and I, I just want to go to church. I just want to be a solid believer and trust hey, Jesus. Bro, I, under, I understand that. But that's, that's a good question. It's because I think we, we misunderstand the nature of the gospel, what we're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. it's, not, we're, it's not the big things that we work to change. It's the little things that we work to change. The fact that you're you're married and you have children and you're raising your children and teaching them the right the right things and you're you're you, know, you have a local church body that that ministers to those in the church and the broader community. Those that's what you're supposed to do. That is the essence of postmillennialism. Postmillennialism isn't taking over the world. Postmillennialism is taking the gospel to all the nations and teaching them whatever Jesus taught us to teach that all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. That, and the, here's the thing, that's the most unexciting thing in the world. <laughs> some, some guy gets up there and he talks about, uh, you know, well, you know, this event took place in the Middle East and this is, an, and here's a passive Bible verse that talks about that. And this is an indication that Jesus is coming back soon, blah, 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 blah. The same type of stuff that's been going on for 100, 200, 300, 400 years. The same Bible verses with different historical circumstances and different people. See, that that's the jazz. People mm -hmm. like to hear the jazz. They don't like to hear, well, you mean I'm responsible for the way I live in the world? Yeah, mm -hmm. that's what you're, that's the deal. That's what it's all about. And if enough Christians did that, if enough Christians did that and applied the Bible to their own life and every area of life, and then including economics and business and law and medicine and art and in music. If, if Christians just did that naturally, we would see the world change. Mm -hmm. So it is, that's why I say by going to Revelation 20 for building your, your millennial view, it's the wrong place. The first series of books I wrote is called God and Government. And people say, oh, you wrote a book about politics. Actually, I didn't. I wrote a book about government. Mm. Government isn't the same thing as politics. And so you start with God as the governor of all things. We are to be self-governors under God, self-disciplined under God. We are to, the, uh, the family is a government. Mm -hmm. the church is a government and the civil and there's civil government. They all have jurisdictional responsibilities for what they do. And that's, but you don't start with the, the civil dimension of government, except in a defensive way initially, because the civil government has taken over all the other governments. We've got to, we have to decrease the power of the state. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, it's going to come down to the individual making decisions for himself, herself, children, family, school, and everything else. Everything else must be interpreted and must be evaluated in terms of God's law economics is not neutral. The mm -hmm. Bible has a great deal to say about oikonomi. O the economics, what is it made up of two words? Oikos, house, and namos, law. Economics is the lawful ordering of a household, mm -hmm. which means economics is based on law. There are certain economic laws that you have to abide by. That governments, because they have power and authority, can they can try to subvert those laws, and it doesn't work. You follow God's laws personally in your family, in your church, in your business, and at the civil level as well. I mean, printing money and giving money to people violates God's law. It's stealing. You, it's the it's uh, uh, I think it's uh, Isaiah chapter one. One of the judgments that came on Israel was their water, their, their wine had been diluted with water and their silver had become dross. They mm. were cheating people. 
Okay. And the, when the government prints money or puts digits in and, and just gives money away, that's stealing. It dilutes it dilutes the purchasing power of your dollar. Yeah. That's why we're seeing infl inflation is not an increase in prices. Inflation is an increase in the money supply that results in the increase of prices because there are art is artificial money, fake money, counterfeit money chasing the same number of goods. Mm -hmm. and so the result of that, what happens is, is that prices go up because demand goes up. But governments can get away with it because they have the power of the sword and they're doing something outside of their governmental jurisdiction. If you and I decided to do that, we'd be put in jail. <laughs> Come with me. Yeah, but exactly. Thing, people vote. People will vote for, for politicians to do that very thing because they're getting some benefit. So that's why I say post-millennialism is, in fact, self-discipline and following God's commandments and then applying them to the broader culture. Wow. Yeah. So then you would say, and I think I've heard this, but you could say it here, um, out of, again, back to the millennial, because that's kind of how we think, although I agree that we have more and more distinctions the, the, the further into history we get. Because uh, you can't just say you're a Christian anymore, or you're even or evangelical. You're yeah, you this or that. You got to define things. Too, Everything, right? yeah, define. Um, out of the four main positions of the millennium and and end times and eschatological stuff, which one is? Are any of them um, positive and and, and good and, and looking toward the future or are they all I mean you know a rapture and millions of Jews being slaughtered and, and this and that and well there is no real reign of Christ and all these different kind of a lot of it sounds negative but I mean are you saying that the post-millennial view post is, is a pos positive opt optimism it's, it's all, some all millennials will say well I'm an optimistic all millennialist I mean okay, <laughs> right okay. I've heard that other people will say I'm a pan millennialist that will all pan out in the end but right. we don't live our life like that yeah. I'm going to go to college and yeah, it'll all pan out in the end. I don't have to study. I don't have to get up and go to class. It'll all pan out in the end. Uh, we don't do that. But when we get to theology, we seem to just kind of, eh, it's, we don't really care. It yeah. doesn't really matter. I love Jesus and Jesus loves me. Now, that's a place to start. But if you read the book of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 5, the writer to the Hebrews stops in mid-thought. And he says, I can't go on anymore. By this time, you should be teachers, but now you need somebody to teach you the elementary elementary principles of the oracle, oracles of God. You need milk now. Mm -hmm. You've you got to go back to the milk stage when you should be at the meat stage. And it's that that has your senses trained to be to, to discern good and evil. See, you, you know, it, there's, there's no cop out here. There's no place to hide from what God requires of us. But at the same time, I, I talk about a circle of responsibility. Your circle of responsibility starts with you. You're responsible for your life. Don't make excuses. Don't blame shift. You're married and you have children. Your family is your second circle of responsibility. Your job is your third circle of responsibility because it's obvious that you need it in order to, to, to you know, to, to, uh, uh, take care of your family. The church is a circle of responsibility. The broader culture is a circle of responsibility. You got to keep all those things in mind without neglecting any of them, but beginning with yourself and your family and your children. And, and if you get that in order, if enough Christians got all that in order, we could change, we could change the world. Yeah. No, oh, amen. Yeah. I, I often, I mean, my whole Christian life, which has not been very long, but I've heard so frequently, uh, well, you know, God could send revival, you know, this and this and this. And it's like, yeah, amen. Amen. Let's pray for that. But I mean, first of all, if you go to the the two great awakenings, the second one was pretty. Uh, they, got worse. they got worse and worse. Couldn't well, yeah, very much. It opened it opened up the door for Mormonism and Unitarianism yeah, yeah, and all sorts yeah. of other stuff. So yeah. it's not as rose colored glasses as we like to think. But a lot of times now, when I when I hear that, I'll think or even say, uh, and if it comes up even in preaching or just talking to someone, it's like, well, where, where should it start though? I mean, do we just really? Yes, God could just make everybody different but like is that how he works is that the economy in which you know especially as believers we're walking uh, in newness of life putting on the spirit putting off the flesh and so on yeah. it starts with us though why, why don't yeah. you be better why don't you serve christ more? Israel. why so was on. israel supposed to keep god's commandments so the nations so the nations would come and say 
wow, look, look at you. Look what God's done for you. I want what you want. Yeah. Here you had King Solomon. People came from around the world because supposedly he had all this wisdom, which he which he blew near the end of his and and, and end of his career. So yeah, you you do all this, and and I'm, I'm going to tell you right now, your children will be hired over other people because of their ethics. They won't necessarily be hired because they're Christians. They will be hired because of their ethics. Mm. And then once you're in there you begin to change the situation to the situation that you're in. Uh, and, and, and right now, you know, honesty and you know, showing up on time and all these things are important. Uh, that advances God's kingdom because what happens is, is that people are placed in positions of power. It's like, you know, Joseph was placed in positions of power in Egypt and you had Daniel and his three friends given positions of authority in, in Israel because in, in Babylon, because, they stood their ground and they showed that they were better than the, 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 uh, the supposed wise people of his own day. Nebuchadnezzar did not trust his own, uh, uh, what, what would you call it, uh, prophets. Mm-hmm. And they came to him and they said, well, you know, King, why don't you tell us what, the, what dream you had and we'll tell you, oh, how convenient is that? Yeah. Nebuchadnezzar said, no, you got to tell me that you got to tell me what the dream was. And so Daniel comes in. See, all of this works to say, this is what Christians are all about. Mm-hmm. This is, you take your faith and you apply it in the world in which you live. Take the gospel, change hearts, change minds, change lives. No, that's good. No, that's good. Um, what, uh, that's, yeah, well, uh, what are some books, resource? I know you, your website um, or site you're a president over, uh, AmericanVision.org. What are some other resources? You mentioned several titles. Say, say someone's like, all right, well, I've always had a little problems with my end times, or I've not really thought about it. This is pretty interesting. I'd like to know more. What should someone go and read, um, even whether they're seminary trained or even just a lay person and everybody in between, a couple books that they should go check out. Well, I, I, I have a number of them, obviously, but the, you, you want to start real simple, just as Jesus, I have a book called It's Jesus Coming Soon. Okay. Very short book. You can read it an hour or so. Uh, the next one is Wars and Rumors of Wars, which is just on parts of part of Matthew chapter 23 and, all, and most of 24. Then I've got Last Day's Madness, which covers a little more of Matthew 24, but plus other topics as well. So you got... Is Jesus coming soon? Wars and rumors of wars, and last day's madness. And then I have um, uh, a book, The Rapture and the Fig Tree Generation. You can get all of those at AmericanVision.org, and then they will take you to other things. I articles, you know, dozens and dozens of articles. You go to AmericanVision.org on on all kinds of topics. If you're looking for America's Christian history, I deal with that in in the, uh, America's Christian history, the untold story. Mm-hmm. Apologetics, you know, defending the faith. We just we published a. Um, I have a book called Thinking Straight in a Crooked World. Great for high school students. Uh, Greg Bonson, who was a professor of mine at Reformed Theological Seminary, uh, wrote uh, Pushing the Antithesis uh, Against All Opposition. And then we have the, the newest edition to that, that trilogy called The Impossibility of the Contrary. Um, so uh, we have a book. We have books on economics. We have books on history. Uh, books on apologetics, of course, lots of books on, on eschatology. Um, we pretty much cover the gambit in terms of, you know, topics. Of, and I've got um, my God and Government book, uh, which will, will take, it was, it was designed for high school, high school students, will take you through a full biblical worldview, uh, how the Bible applies to every area of life, that government is not synonymous with politics. Politics is one aspect of government, but I deal with mm-hmm. economics and, um, uh, you know, human rights, uh, uh, how to care for the poor, the tithe, all, all these types of things are in it. It's 30, 30 chapters. They can be read independently, but if you take, go through the book, uh, it'll, you give a, a pretty good assessment of what a Christian worldview is. Okay, great. No, that's, no, that's a lot. That's great. Yeah, um, it, is, it is a lot. <laughs> I don't want to put, look people, I don't want to, you know, start small. I always tell people start small. Yeah. You some eschatology. <clears throat> Get my book. Is Jesus coming soon? If that intrigues you, you go to the other ones. Uh, if um, re- restoring the foundation, 
before restoring the foundation of 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 of, of the, the the world, I was a smaller book. You can also get get that at American Vision as well. It's it's a condensed kind of a condensed ver version of of God and Government. Um, so it, all this material is out there, but it just comes down to responsibility. You know, applying your faith consistently in those circles of responsibility. And as you get more responsible in the world in which you live, you begin you, you begin to have dominion over over those areas, and you see you see a transformed form world as a result. Yeah, no, that's that's amazing. That's so true. Yeah, I think we live in such a pessimistic, so pessimistic. And of course, you know, if you have that view, you know, Jesus is coming soon, the rapture is coming soon. I mean, you could get on Facebook, you can know, anybody, any comments in YouTube or Twitter or anything like that. It's 99% of the time, it seems that everybody's just, this is yeah. it, this is it, this is it, buckle up or whatever. Yeah. And you're just like, yeah. uh, we've heard this before. I mean, we've it's heard just... it before. It's a boy, boy that cried wolf. And people are getting, oh, yeah. I think they're getting tired of blood moons, all yeah. kinds of things. People have come up, it's sold uh, hundreds of thousands of copies of books that now they, they, they can't give them away. Uh, so there's a much yeah. better approach, and that's the biblical approach, applying the Bible to every area of life. Yeah. I, I appreciate Dr. Gary DeMar taking time and talking about eschatology, end times, and being faithful, being, you know, enjoying and, and loving life, living life uh, as Christ calls us to do. So again, thank you so much for this opportunity to talk. And uh, maybe we can talk again in the future. Yeah, we'll do that. Sure. All Thanks, right. Thanks, Thanks, Gary. Bye. -bye. Bye.